We're jumping back into chapter 13, and we're going to expand on what we learned, um, what we learned already, which was equations of motion in rectangular coordinates. So the first thing we learned is that what kinetics is, is basically using Newton's second law. And then we learned for the equations of rectangular coordinates, we could take the vector in rectangular coordinates, f equals ma, where f is a vector, a is a vector, and we can break that down into three equations. Some of the forces in the x, some of the forces y, and some of the forces in the z. Instead of all three equaling zero, like we learned in statics, they're equal to mass times the acceleration in each direction. Okay, so this slide, we are just redoing it. And we're going to redo it here with normal tangential. This part is not a big, a big jump. We know it's the same equation. Sum of the forces equal mass times acceleration. And we know that the forces can be in 3D. And the acceleration is also in 3D. So we have a vector on both sides. When we have that, we can say, well, we no longer have i, j, and k in normal tangential. What do we have instead? With normal tangential, remember we said no longer do we have a fixed coordinate system. We have a particle that's moving along a path. And that particle is going to have three new coordinate systems, or three new axes. The first one is going to be ut, a unit vector in the tangential direction, which is the only component of velocity, and it's going to change as that particle slides along that path. Uh, second one is our un. Our un goes towards that instantaneous center of rotation if we were to approximate every curve as if it was a circle. Where is the center of that circle? We always point towards that center, and that's our un. Okay, so we have a ut and a un. Does anybody know what the third one is? Binormal, good. We just mentioned it briefly when we first went through them, but binormal would be out of the page in this case, and that's a ub, a binormal. So ut, un, and ub are our new three unit vectors, just like I, I, J, and K. Uh, the one that's coming out of the board, what's special about UB? Well, uh, let me do the equations first, and then we'll ask that same question again. So if I do this, I'm going to say my force vector now looks like I have some amount of force in the tangential direction times UT, plus some other amount of force in the normal direction times UN, plus some other force in the binormal direction times uh, u, ub. See how that's the vector in the normal tangential coordinate system. It's going to be equal to mass times acceleration in the t times ut plus acceleration the n times un plus acceleration the b times ub. Okay, that's my vector equation. And then, of course, I can make three scalar equations out of that. I can say in the ut direction, I'm going to have some of the forces in the tangential direction equals mass times acceleration in the tangential direction. In the un direction, some of the forces in the normal direction equal mass times acceleration in the normal. And in the ub direction, some of the forces in the b equals mass times acceleration in the b. Okay. Do we know anything special about the binormal direction? Since ut is always changing and un is always changing, and you can think of an object instantaneously going around a circle, at all points it's going to have a tangential component to acceleration, which is the feeling you get when the car pushes you back when you hit the gas, or and the normal component, which is the feeling pushing you against the door. But those are the only two feelings. That's it. So what's acceleration in the binormal direction? Zero, all the time. It has to be zero. If your coordinate system is set up correctly, acceleration by normal is zero because we only have two components to acceleration, which means our third equation is really just back to statics. Some of the forces in the binormal direction equals zero. Okay, so that's why normal tangential is so useful. If we set up the coordinate system correctly, we actually have a statics problem for one of the dimensions. I'm gonna do one example problem. We got an airplane, 13-81. Five megagram airplane is flying at a constant speed of 350 kilometers per hour along a horizontal circular path. 
If the banking angle, theta equals 15 degrees, determine the uplift force L acting on the airplane and the radius R of the circular path. Neglect the size of the airplane. Alrighty, we are going to start putting our givens down. Uh, five megagrams, what's that telling me? Mass of the airplane. So mass of the airplane equals five megagrams. What the heck is a five megagram? 5,000 kilograms might be a really nice way to write that one. Well, a mega is 10 to the sixth, and a kilo is 10 to the third, so you're right. 5,000 kilogram airplane flying at a constant speed. Uh, the velocity of the airplane is equal to 350 kilometers per hour. Do you think that's going to be a useful unit? Yeah, we probably want meters per second, right? Meters per second is typically what we like. So let's just go ahead and take care of that right in our givens. We're going to multiply that by uh, 1,000. No, that's not right. 1,000 meters for one kilometer. And I could say uh, one hour is 60 seconds. Uh, that's not right. <laughs> 60 minutes. <laughs> and um, one minute is 60 seconds. And I can just cross out my units to make sure I didn't make a mistake. Hour, hour, kilometer, kilometer, and I have meters per second. OK, we have our velocity. We have our weight, and we have that theta equals 15 degrees. Did they give us enough information to find two unknowns? We're supposed to find uh, R and L. But what would clue you off to the fact that we might want to use normal tangential in this? Circular path, exactly right. So we typically use normal tangential when we know the path, when we know something very useful about where this thing is moving, that's when normal tangential is useful. So in this case, it says circular path, and it also says horizontal circular path. That is a very big clue. So that horizontal circular path, we immediately think, huh, let's just see what normal tangential can do for us. So let's see if we can set up those three directions. I like to start with tangential because I think it's the easiest. It's always the direction you're moving. Where's our tangential axis? Good. The plane is moving this way, so I need my arrow going the right way. This is our tangential, right? That's our tangential axis towards you because that's the way it's moving. So I'm just going to put a little dot right there. And we'll call that, that dot is UT. OK, where is my normal? Towards R, very good. It's a horizontal circular path, right? So you have to picture this plane is coming towards us. But if we looked at it from the top, the plane would be going in a circle. The plane would be moving this way. This would be our UT, which is coming out of the board. And this would be our UN, which would be pointing this way. That's our UN. So we have our UT and our UN. Where's our UB? Straight up. Okay, hey, now what? Exactly right. Now we go to the equations of motion, right? So we always have the exact same steps. We're going to write our givens and finds. We're going to choose our coordinate system. Uh, and after we choose our coordinate system, we're going to use our equations of motion. It depends on what coordinate system we choose, which equations of motion we're going to use. So let's use our equations of motion. I missed one. What's another really important step on any one of these problems? It's a free body diagram, OK? We need a free body diagram for all kinetics. So why don't I go ahead and draw a different plane so I can draw my free body diagram. And I always recommend tracing it with your finger and just going over the, the body so that you know. There you go. That's a plane. OK, so now we need to put all of the forces acting on the plane. We know that there's a lift force. That's already given to us. The lift force looks like this. OK, that's the force of the wings pushing the plane upwards. What, else, what other forces do we have in this plane? Weight, pulling us down. That's it. OK, and we know that there is an angle given here, which is 15 degrees. So we could say some of the forces in the tangential direction equal mass times acceleration in the tangential direction. Uh, what are my forces in the tangential direction? Yeah, but we also don't have any forces. When you look at that free body diagram, none of those are in the tangential direction, right? So either way you look at it, this, is, uh, this equation is super helpful. 
it reminds us that zero is equal to zero, so that's nice. Let's go ahead and look at binormal. Some of the forces in the binormal direction equal mass times acceleration in the binormal. Uh, in the binormal direction, we're going to have uh, L cosine of 15 degrees. That's going up, minus W equal mass times acceleration in the binormal. What is the acceleration in the binormal direction? Zero. We're not accelerating the binormal direction, ever. It's always zero. So in that case, we just have L cosine of 15 degrees is equal to W. So we have L cosine 15 equals um, weight is just mass times gravity. So we have 5,000 kilograms. Gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. That's another given I should probably put up here, that G equals 9.81 meters per second squared. We're on Earth. And we can solve for L, 50,780 uh, newtons. Okay. That answered one of our questions. Now it asks for R. What are we going to do for R? Yeah, we're just going to do the third equation of motion which is some of the forces in the normal direction equal mass times acceleration in the normal. Uh, the normal direction, let's just put it on our diagram. Our tangential direction is just a dot. Our binormal direction was up here. This is our UB. And our normal direction is going this way. That's our UN. Okay. The, com the force that we're going to have would be the component of the lift force in that direction, which is going to be the sine of 15 times L. So we've got some of the forces, I'm sorry, we've got L sine of 15 degrees. That's our only force because all of the weight is in the binormal. Is going to be equal to mass times acceleration in the normal. We know mass, we know L, so we can say 50,780 newtons times the sine of 15 degrees equals mass times acceleration in the normal. Sorry, I put mass in. 5,000 kilograms times acceleration than normal. Solve for acceleration than normal. It's equal to 5780 sine 15 degrees over 5,000. Thank you. 2.62 meters per second squared. Now what? This is where we have to think back to what we learned about in normal tangential coordinates when we were in kinematics. We learned velocity is equal to the mag magnitude of velocity times ut, and we learned that acceleration is equal to uh, dv dt, the rate of change of velocity in the t direction, plus v squared over rho in the n direction. Okay? This right here is our a n v squared over rho, and in this case, rho is r. So we would say v squared, which we're given, is uh, 97.2. So v squared over rho equals v squared over r equals 50, no, I'm sorry, 2.62 meters per second squared. And we know that v is equal to 97.2. Unfortunately, I ran out of room, so I'm going to go up where I do have room in this red box up here and finish the problem. And we would say um, 97.2 squared over R is equal to 2.62 meters per second squared. R is equal to 97.2 squared over 2.62. 3.594 or 3.5? Very good. So 3.5 or th roughly 3.6 kilometers is how big the radius of this plane is circling around. Okay, hopefully you can see the power of normal tangential through that problem because it's something that we really, it would have been hard to approach with using rectangular because we wouldn't have had the v squared over r to help us with that last part. Yeah.